The special meeting tonight is a topic that possibly touches everyone in this room in one way or another. We are privileged to have Dr. Rick DeLude from Salem, Oregon here to educate you on crisis involving tick-borne diseases and how it affected his son Alec. Rick is raised right here in Midland, graduated from Dow High, 1976, then attended Central Michigan University Bachelor of Science degree in 1980 while playing Division I football. He went on to Wayne State University School of Medicine, graduated in 1985. He did his internal med residency at Wayne State University Hospitals. Rick completed his anesthesiology residency at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1994, where he was also a med flight physician for the University of Wisconsin Hospitals. His professional experiences included being a staff attending physician at Detroit Receiving Hospital Emergency Medicine Department between his residencies, attending an anesthesiologist with the Oregon Anesthesiologist Group out of Portland, practicing in Salem Health in, from 1994 to 2016 when he retired. Additionally, Rick uh, trained paramedics, medical students, and residents in airway management. He also is, was the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology in Salem, Oregon. Tonight, Rick will be speaking on Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses with the emphasis on their neuropsychiatric manifestations. His mission is dedicated to sharing how widespread the diseases are and the education to healthcare professionals and the general public. I'm very proud and extremely honored to introduce the one and only Dr. Rick DeLue. Oh, there we go. All right. Yay. Okay. So uh, I have reworked this talk about six times a Sunday, and it started out as a uh, day-long seminar on tick-borne disease, and I've, I've scaled way back, and I'm trying to focus on the mental health aspects of this, um, but I will, it will degrade into other aspects, so I apologize. I'm, I'm trying not to uh, have it a, a lecture, more of just an informal chat. So I'm, uh, I grew up here, but I spent the last 30 years in, uh, in the Northwest, I met my wife from the, she's from Southern California, relocated up to Salem in 1994. And, um, and this is an hour west of where I live. This is Oregon coast. And um, the, the whole Pacific coast is terribly endemic with ticks, both the, the coastal tick and the uh, Isocetes specifica. So that's the western version of the deer tick, the black-legged tick. And I, after some things happened this spring, I have just run into people left and right who have tick issues from being on the coast. Now, we have them where I live also, but the coast is terribly endemic, especially in Northern California, Humboldt, that area, southern, uh, the Southern Oregon coast. Um, um, this is where I've spent the last 30 years, and uh, Jeff has visited me here. So this is uh, Salem. Um, it's in a position about an hour south of Portland in the middle of the Willamette Valley. The Willamette River runs south and north, <clears throat> about 150 miles. It's about eight, the valley's about 80 miles wide. That's looking to the northeast at Mount Hood and um, the, coast, the Cascade Range. And there's another, the Coastal Range is to the west. And it's, it was a great, been a great place. I raised two kids here. And, and uh, a good medical community. You know, the natives called this the Valley of Sickness because uh, it has the highest pollen counts in any place in the country. It's the grass seed capital of the country. And, and then when the settlers arrived, they brought smallpox and TB, so it continued to be the Valley of Sickness. So I practiced um, anesthesiology with uh, OAG, Oregon Anesthesia Group out of Portland, Oregon, as Jeff alluded to. And uh, they have a, a 
we covered about 12 different hospitals, about 300 anesthesiologists, most of in the metro area, Corvallis, and here in Salem. And uh, Salem Health is a 454-bed uh, uh, level two trauma center, and it's just big, busy enough to have lots of problems. No, uh, no true level one nursery, but everything in between, you know, four to 5,000 deliveries, there's five prisons in Salem, so the, the gun and knife club is well represented. And it was a, it was a great place, great surgeons, a, a wide variety of cases. And, um, you know, I miss it. I retired uh, because of health reasons. My body fell apart after football. But um, um, it's, a, it's a great place to come visit. I encourage everybody to come to the Northwest. There's 500 vineyards uh, from within an hour where I live and 700 in the valley. And I just had um, my nephew's niece help me set up my first website last week. So I passed out a few cards. Everyone's welcome to go check it out. I, I'm trying to put information out there. I, as I mentioned, I, I hired my first web editor today out of Florida, a friend of a friend down there, and he's adding things. Um, but if you use a QR code, it'll take you to the alexplace.com. And uh, I'm trying to just edu educate my colleagues because, quite frankly, um, I'm here because I'm pissed and um, at both myself and the 40 physicians or so who tried to help my son but totally whipped on it. And I know many here are familiar with that. And so I'm trying to rectify that in a small way. I'm late to the party, but I'm not going quietly into the night. And uh, I may storm the CDC with a pitchfork and <clears throat> torches, but um, I've, I've tried to tone this down on um, being negative toward uh, the powers that be in medicine. I'll let you decide after you see what I have here um, how to approach that. And so my disclosures are: I am not, I am not an expert on this topic. Please know that. I've never taken care of a patient who had tick-borne disease. I was, I was in the ghetto in Detroit as an ER doc. I didn't see a lot of Lyme problems there, but. Urban areas have Lyme disease. New York City, Central Park has Lyme. Um, you know, uh, I just helped, tried to help my 27-year-old son for six years, and uh, I have no financial interest. I'd encourage every everyone in here, the doc, you have to be a physician, um, or PhD, I believe, to join ILADS, and I've joined uh, the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. And this has made up individuals like myself who've been affected personally with spouses, children, uh, family members, and friends. Um, there are actually a few people in this that don't fall into that, but most of them do. It's about 550 physicians, and I'm going to their meeting this fall, and uh, it's up in the air whether I, I present my case, my son's case yet or not, but. Um, I've interacted with quite a few people there, and they're quality folks who have uh, the public's best interests in heart, trust me. And <clears throat> Jeff went through my CV, I won't. Um, for the six, the seven years since I retired have been interesting. Um, I think uh, I've done like a mini fellowship in psychiatry, functional medicine, and integrative medicine. Um, trying to help my son, and um, I learned more medicine in the last few years than I did in the previous 30. And this is why I'm here. So Alec, uh, he was a great kid. This is us fishing Alaska. So um, he was just a ball of energy. You have to excuse me, I have to tell a little story here. So. He was into everything, intense, loved building things, had his business when he was in his teenage years, just active, physical, good athlete. I kept him out of football, um, but soccer, water polo, um, mountain biking, skiing. He became a whitewater guide at Oregon State. They had a whitewater guide school there, and uh, he completed that. And. Um, Walked on the rowing team, Division One rowing team, and made the varsity boat as a freshman. And uh, you know, this was in Vancouver, um, Vancouver Island, actually, up in British Columbia. And he was a great kid. I would go to practice with the coaches, you know, and uh, got to know him. It's not much of a spectator sport, but you know, the people are very unique and intense. And uh, 
We spent a lot of time here, just been here. This is the Deschutes River in eastern Oregon. So Oregon's got like seven climate zones. So this is a high desert at 4,000 feet. Very good fly fishing. Alex spent the second summer after he graduated from high school uh, fighting fire with the Forest Service. This is Glacier National Park. He was out of Wyoming. And uh, he was on a crew that went up there for a fire. So he slept outside on the ground. He was outside all the time as a kid. I don't, he never remembered a tick bite. I never heard him talk about it. I never saw a rash, but he was in that element all the time. And I had, uh, this is the Deschutes again. Uh, Jeff pulled two ticks off my back two years ago when we went fishing there together. Last year I had relapsing fever from the tick and I soaked through a mattress for a week with headaches and myalgias. And I developed a chronic cough that no one could explain and extreme fatigue. And I finally, a naturopath I go to, sent off some Pizza, fancy PCR test on sputum and came back with three really weird mycoplasma infections and got on some antibiotics and feeling better. Um, but these guys are like the nature's dirty needle. The toxic potpourri of bugs are in ticks. And so I don't know where he got it, but uh, you know, he, he, he got something. And um, my son, uh, you know, it started in 2017. He was a junior. He complained of headaches, terrible back pain, and couldn't focus, brain fog, sleeping problems. We thought it was just stress. He you know, said that he had the worst headache of his life. So I, you know, anxious dad, I was thinking, worst case scenario, big glioblastoma in his head. So I had an MRI. No, nothing came of it. And it kind of waxed, waxed and waned, but he couldn't continue in school. He had to drop out his junior year. And uh, then we just proceeded on this roller coaster, um, nine psychiatric hospitalizations, 35, 40 physicians, multiple clinics. I couldn't get him to travel to some of the places I wanted to go, but he got turned down by some high power places because he had some suicidal attempts and had extreme rage and anger. This is a mild mannered kid. He never got in a fight in his life. And uh, you know, last summer or two summers ago, I, I fixed, um, 30 holes in the drywall in my other, my past home and countless phones and computers and windows and it was unbelievable. Um, and so he, um, I finally last year he, uh, he assaulted me three times and the third time he hurt my brother-in-law also and he got, we had law enforcement involved 30 plus times with mental health crisis teams and um, and the only way we could get him uh, any serious psychiatric help was through the, um, the criminal justice system. There are no civil commitments anymore. And so he got arrested and he ended up going to Polk County Jail. And he spent 50 days there, 45 days in solitary confinement, lights on, no clothes, concrete floor, banging his head against the floor. And I couldn't communicate with him because the phone system and our correction system is terrible. It's like talking through a thousand foot straw. And uh, I was very frustrated and I couldn't visit him either because of uh, he assaulted me. I was a victim. And I begged them. In, in the meantime, I read, um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I want to talk about something. I read this story and I encourage everyone to read this who's here. So this is, a, this is about a 14 year old in Iowa. And uh, my naturopath shared this with me right before Alec went into, into jail. And it's written in a graphic novel fashion because this young man was a comic book aficionado. And he somehow had a tick bite, became suicidal and homicidal. They institutionalized him. His family spent $400,000 trying to take care of him. And a year into this, finally, um, a nurse practitioner who was working for a naturopath had been to a conference and noticed these strange markings on this kid's skin. And, uh, and by the way, they sent him to the Mendinger Clinic. I read that through the lines and they turned down Alex. So this is a place in Houston with a residency and fellowships in psychiatry who turned my son down, but they went and it's $2,000 out of day, out of pocket, I'm sorry. And the, the chairman there has written a book on OCD. This kid had terrible OCD, so did my son. And I got this book and I read it. There is not one chapter that mentions infection um, causing OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And um, I find that 
disheartening at that level of psychiatry that they don't understand this happens. So anyhow, backtrack to this. This is uh, so. This is uh, written by Chris Newby, who's uh, an engineer by training who did a felt, <clears throat> did a um, graduate degree in um, scientific journalism at Stanford, and she wrote the book Bitten. I encourage everyone to read it. It's on my website, and I've talked to Chris and. Uh, so she, she brought uh, this case report from Ed Breitschwert, who's at North Carolina State University. He's a veterinary and infectious disease specialist, and he is the world's foremost expert on Bartonella. And, um, and so she took that case report and uh, turned it into this graphic novel um, story, which is on uh, nowthisnews.com. It's on the internet in different places. But um, basically, so let's go forward to where the nurse sees the skin, uh, the skin tracking on this kid. And she says, those look, those look like bark tracks. So Bartonella hanselii leaves these pathognomonic skin markings. It's basically the collagen breaking down in your skin. And they look like stretch marks. You know, there's a lot of ways you get them, postpartum people get them, but they go perpendicular little planes of tension in your skin. They happen in the axilla, groin, abdomen, back, legs. And um, when was the last time you saw a psychiatrist examine someone's skin? So they can make a diagnosis right there. So she brought it to their attention um, and they biopsy it. You can grow the bug right from this, these skin lesions. You'll see some slides here later on. And sent it to Ed Breitschwert at North Carolina. And he developed a special growth media because Martinell is very top the culture. Most of these bugs are called stealth organisms, and this is a root of most of our health problems in modern society. And he was able to grow it, and, uh, and this is this, this kid's um, drugs um, regimen. Now it goes chronologically left to right, and if you go from the bottom to the top, you see it's nothing but antipsychotics and psychotic medicine. And if you follow the bar graph across, you can see what happens as they, as time went on, they finally put them on rifibutin, minocycline, and clorithromycin. And look how the psych meds dropped off. In six months, he was off all psychiatric meds. He's in college in grade now. I thought this was going to be my son's story. So an infection causes psychiatric problems. And there's over 100 infections that cause psychiatric problems. And our psychiatric colleagues are not looking for that. They're abrogating their duty. So this is my son. This case was, this case was presented in Dublin, England, or Dublin, Ireland, excuse me, um, in June by Dr. Edward Moziani. So going back to his story, um, He's in jail. He finally, they finally had a bed. He, was, he spent 50 days in jail because we were waiting for a bed to open up the state hospital. We have an 800-bed uh, state psychiatric hospital in Salem. And if you've ever seen One Flues of Cuckoo's Nest or Jack Nicholson, that's the facility. They've upgraded it, thankfully. But, um, so he finally got in there, and I was, in, in the meantime, I'm trying to get this a Bartonella test done after I read that, and I begged the jail. I offered to buy him a centrifuge. Um, the test comes from Igenix. You'll hear more about this. This is a lab in California uh, that is the only place you should be looking to have your Lyme-related uh, problems and tick-borne diseases evaluated. Um, I begged them to test him, and they refused. And um, so I finally got into the state hospital. I didn't have much traction there. That's, that the lead uh, physician wouldn't listen to me. Um, I finally found a junior psychiatrist who would listen to me, and I prevailed upon him to let me hire a con consultant to advise him how to treat this, because they didn't buy into this at all. So I, I hired, uh, I contacted Ed Moziani, and uh, he's a, a Yale and NIH trained rheumatologist who is, um, is another Bartonella guru in Washington, D.C., and he, he did a consult, and they listened, they started on some antibiotics, and my son was getting better. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, a federal ruling, the Mosman ruling, that mandates that if you were in a psychiatric facility for 90 days, you have to be kicked out, or if a felony one year, and it doesn't matter if you're still psychotic or suicidal, I begged them to keep him, my son was getting better, and, um, but Alec, 
were, he knew he wanted out there bad, and they, he had to be able to aid and assist. And so he studied the questions they gave him, and he got out. They sent him back to jail. Everyone knew he was going to be discharged home, but because of the system, he had to go to back to jail for a few days, and we deteriorated again, and finally home. At that point, we insisted he stay at the, at the local homeless shelter where he'd been before, because we, you know, Having a 250 pound raging wild man in your house is not conducive to um, a happy household. And my wife and I had to live in separate places, so she would get, we would get a break at times from him. And um, so he, he did 10 days at the um, facility, the homeless shelter, and his, his rage was gone. He was laughing, joking. At this time, he, he hadn't been able to read, watch a movie, smile. He had anhedony, couldn't enjoy anything. He had terrible, intrusive thoughts of melting faces. He had disinhibition like you can't believe. He would strip down naked and walk down the middle of the street. He would tell weird, bizarre sexual things to our neighbors. I had to move two years ago because my neighbors put a restraining order on him. And I couldn't tolerate him going to jail, but he went to jail anyhow. So we get him out of the hospital, and uh, we, I have him back in. We're taking his meds down to him every day. He hated taking all the meds, and he said he, they made him feel like a zombie, and they did. They sucked. The psych meds are terrible. And they considered it a success that they were 40 to 50 percent of the time. And there was no cure here. This is just to knock down the symptoms a little bit. Um, but he was doing better, uh, still having some sleeping problems. His psychosis was much better. He organized a ski trip. He, had, he was a big skier. I hadn't ordered skied in three years. And he organized a, ski, organized a ski trip with his cousins and his sister mom. And uh, then he had a week, unfortunately, <clears throat> six weeks out. Um, this says two weeks. It was actually six weeks. Um, he overdosed on my antihypertensive meds on Friday night. Um, I was with him at the time, and uh, he came and laid down next to me. I, we were making, I was making some lasagna, and he was helping. And then he laid down ne next to me after we were done, and the lasagna was in the oven. And he said, Dad, I'm sorry I took all your antihypertensive meds. And he had done this before, about three years ago, in an ICU and some days of presers. And I was, I was just kind of miffed. I said, oh, not again. I had been locking everything up, but I slipped that one night. You know, I've got like 200 supplements around, and it's... I slipped up, and uh, I tried to get him to throw up. But and I asked him when he when he took them. I thought, well, if you just took them, I can get you. I can make it throw up and get some syrup, the cack or something. He said, oh no, it was two hours ago. So no, they're already reabsorbed. So we got EMS there. They're very prompt within minutes. But his blood pressure. He, he just took. I just had my blood pressure prescription refilled. So and doubled the dose. Double ninety. 90 10 milligram amlodipines, calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blockers are what you do not want to overdose on. I got him to the ER quickly. Um, they got him right up to the ICU. We had a very busy ICU, great critical care, and it was full core press, so they were every vasopressor known to mankind. Those are blood pressure, for those that don't know, those are meds that maintain your blood pressure. You got intubated at one in the morning. And uh, he was too unstable to dialyze, too unstable for ECMO. And uh, I still was thinking it was going to be OK, because we did this before. He's young and healthy, right? I mean, 27 years old. He was a Division I athlete. Um, but he had tick-borne diseases in his body, in his heart, in his autonomic nervous system. He'd been complaining to chest pain, breathing difficulty, fatigue. and. Um, and his heart stopped at 8.31 in the morning and it threw our lives into a wood chipper. And, uh, and uh, this was completely preventable. And so, excuse me. And so this is, uh, I contacted that night. I'm back up a second. So that night I called Ed Breitschert because I'd read that article and I'd read that. He's written 186 scientific papers. He lost both his parents to tick-borne diseases, and he had a magnificent write-up on both of them. He grew up in Maryland, his dad was a steel worker, his mom raised four boys. He did a magnificent write-up on four of them. So I called him, you know, Saturday night, you know, I just lost my son that morning, and uh, he's at the vet school. I didn't have a cell number, I didn't know how to get a hold of him, so I, I just, you know, I'm the next year doc. I just cold called the, I knew every vet school's got an emergency department, so I just cold called the vet school. 
and I, uh, the uh, receptionist said, oh, we, oh, we don't give out cell numbers. I'm like, okay, so this is why I just said, this is what happens, and please take a message for me. And uh, she did, and at, uh, at four or five, five o'clock the next morning, I got a call from a 75-year-old researcher, and, uh, and, and he agreed to look at my son's tissue. So I arranged, a, we arranged an autopsy, I also contacted Alan McDonald, you see Alan's uh, images at the bottom there, and I, Alan is, uh, was a Lyme investigator of the year and, uh, 20 years ago. He's 75. Alan McDonald discovered Lyme disease, Lyme bugs, Borrelia, in stillborn kids and Alzheimer's patients in the 80s, and it's published on this. Not the extent it deserves, though, because uh, he was kind of blackballed in the Northeast, had to go to Texas for a while. The medical community did not like hearing this. Um, but he's still working, he's still doing research, although he just retired. Um, so I called him, and he agreed to look at Alex Tissues and blood uh, pro bono. He would not accept anything from me. And this, this slide was presented in Dublin. So this, I don't have slides of the, of the Borrelia, because um, I couldn't find them on short notice, so they just stained. But you can see Bartonella. This is a slide of Gimsa Saint's slide of Bartonella. And he had two species of Bartonella. Bartonella hensley had a classic cat scratch disease bug and a yet undiagnosed one. Um, but they can be seen by smear. And we, no one's looking at blood smears anymore. It has to be a thin blood smear, but pathologists could be diagnosing this. And so we need to prevail upon them to do it. Here's another one. This is the amygdala and the basal ganglia. They're there. And this is a Worth and Starry Silver Stain, which they also show up on. Also show up on. And here's another. And so uh, that's my story. That's why I'm here. Um, but I just wanted to um, speak to the non-clinician or non-medical non people here. Um, and I'll just read this. Um, there's a biological reason for disease, illness. Um, psychosis is not caused by a low titer of antipsychotic drugs. There are, there's a biological reason for it. Find yourself a Lyme literate physician. I'll tell you where you don't find them. At Ivory Tower Medical Centers, okay, and universities, because they're all Touting, following the CDC guidelines, okay? And um, as you'll see, if you read this stuff, they are so wrong, I cannot tell you. I'm gonna to try to, but it... So trust ILADS docs, and I don't say that about myself, but the ones I've read and met, I mean, they're the real deal. Question authorities and certain specialists, in, in particular infectious disease, um, they're their organization is the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, rheumatologists, neurologists, and pediat pediatricians. You can extend that to other primary care people, but those are the ones that I've run into that seem to be the most obstructive on the chronic Lyme situation. Do not undervalue the benefits of botanical the therapies. I never would have, you know, I'm, I'm trained in allopathic medicine, I never would have thought I'd be saying this, but these things are amazing. Everyone should buy the book, Senator Wellness, and read it. It's written by an um, obstetrician who had bad Bartonella in North Carolina, Raleigh, had to retire from his practice, and he couldn't tolerate long-term antibiotics, taught himself some botanical therapy, and he did a magnificent job in a book backed up by real science, and he's, he's on, does YouTubes as well. I'm gonna meet him in Raleigh when I'm down there this fall, but that's why I tell everyone, if anyone you know has problems with tick-borne diseases, start there. None of these things are going to hurt you unless you're on some anticoagulant. There's a few that augment that. But otherwise, you're not going to hurt yourself. You know, these plants have been evolved for, for hundreds of years, <clears throat> thousands of years, rather, to combat um, bugs. And they have hundreds of molecules in each one. And these things have been used by tribes in Amazonia for hundreds of generations. Um, and uh, they're the real deal. Um, don't give up hope and persevere. You can get better. So for the medical folks in, the, in here, I hope I can do this for you, to have an open mind and a sense of curiosity, which, 
you know, the 40 people who tried to help my son didn't have, um, question medical dogma, join ILS if you can. If you get a chance to see a patient, you're seeing patients, look at their skin. It doesn't take very many calories to examine someone's skin. And if you know a psychiatrist, mention this to them. And all other rashes are important. Um, and consider testing anyone with chronic disease, mental health issues, and altered mental status with the neurogenic tick-borne disease panels. You know, these things need to be ruled out before we put someone in a psychiatric institution. I'm talking about Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, autism. You know, this epidemic of gun violence we have, it correlates directly with the increase in tick-borne disease. And, uh, and remember the caveat, false negative tests are common and dangerous to put faith in. You know, if you have a positive test, you can run with that, but don't believe a negative test. Um, they're no better than a flip of a coin, the Eliza and Western blots out there. And when in doubt, this is what the ILAS uh, organization um, touts, this is their position. Treat, it's a disease to be treated clinically. Sometimes you, don't, you can't get laboratory um, backup for this. And I know, you know, medicine, we have to have a test for everything, but sometimes you have to go with your gut. I mean, if you, the patient has chronic fatigue, facial palsy, even if they don't remember a tick bite. And that's, that's one of the problems that um, the IDSA will say, and, and see this is point blank, if you have, if you have uh, fatigue, autism, or Alzheimer's, you do not need to be tested for tick-borne diseases. Um, I mean, who are they trying to save there? Um, that's a sad stance to take, and that's the recent guidelines. So Lyme disease is a polymicrobial multi-system disease. This is the most controversial thing in history of medicine. So here we are, this is the cases, and um, this is a little outdated, but it, the slope is the same. And this is an or, excellent organization, by the way, the Bay Area Lyme Foundation. They do an excellent um, podcast, Detective. I highly encourage everyone to listen to it. Just the numbers, everyone's kind of familiar with this. I'm, I'm sorry, the little out of date there it was the best slide I could get. And uh, so this came out this summer. So 14.5% of the global population is tested seropositive to Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, Borrelia burgdorferi is the Lyme bug. So when we say Lyme disease, there's no Lyme Europe. You know, they, they, in Europe, they call it Borreliosis. They have different organisms there, but it causes some of the same problems. And the Borrelia burgdorferi is sensu latte species. It's just a group of organisms in the Borrelia, that Borrelia family um, and genus that cause the same problem. So 14.5% positive, 9% in the U.S., 21% in Europe. So if, just to extrapolate the numbers, so if you look at 20% of Lyme patients are going to have chronic Lyme problems, okay, they advance to chronic Lyme disease. And the, and the um, CDC and the IDSA will not say chronic Lyme disease, they say post-treatment Lyme syndrome, okay, because they deny the existence of persisting infections despite antibiotics. So if you take 3% of 8 billion, you get 240 million people now have chronic Lyme disease. Now, this is not talking about the other organisms they have. Ticks can have up to 200 different pathogens, and even more if you look at substrains, strains and substrains. And, uh, and the CDC denies Bartonella is, is um, you can contract Bartonella from ticks despite lots of good science in peer-reviewed articles. And I had a question. This is something everyone needs to think about. This was posed in 1996. It hold, it, it's, it's closer than we realize. Most of our chronic diseases, arthritis, dementia, and whatnot, are from chronic in infections. So this is a psychiatrist in New Jersey. Uh, he's been at this for 30 years. I've talked about Bransfield and Mabino in Boston. And he has experienced an epidemic of increasing mental illness, suicide, violence, substance abuse, and developmental disabilities in children. You know, we have to look and see why. And uh, so this is just this summer. Daniel Kinnerar is in Denver. He's a um, he's a doc also. He's got a, an excellent book called a Recovery from Lyme Disease. And uh, he had a, a bad case, and it's a, it's very well written and thought out. And he's just done this study this summer. So ki kids with um, people with eating disorders now are getting better with antibiotics, okay? So an an anorexia nervosa is a psychiatric problem just like psychosis, makes sense. 
So we've been wrong many times in the past. You know, we used to blood do bloodletting for everything. We do we used to, in medicine. We used to do ice stick lobotomies. You remember Jack Nicholson that went through the cuckoo's nest? We used to give soothing narcotic elixirs for fussy babies. There used to be physician recommended cigarettes. Physicians used to recommend trans fats. And how about the Tuskegee study? You know, where in the 1930s we infected African Americans with syphilis and followed them serially with no antibiotics and uh, developed tertiary syphilis. And just recently in the 80s, when uh, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I, I went to med school in the 80s, I remember learning all this exotic stomach surgery that the guy in pyloroplasties and there's chairmen's in academic surgery who made their names on inventing some new reattachment of a small intestine in the stomach. And there was this, there was this, this uh, bold, gastroenterologist in Western Australia, in Perth, um, Barry Wallace, who was noticing uh, that his ulcer patients had this bug in them, uh, H. pylori. He started putting two and two together and said, hey, maybe, maybe it's causing this. And he presented at the next year's Australian Gastroenterological Society meeting. He was laughed off the stage. So he said, I'm going to show them. So he went home next year and he whipped up a vat of H. pylori had his partner scope him, documented he didn't have any ulcer, drank it, just about died from an ulcer, took antibiotics, partner scoped, he felt better, partner scoped him, ulcer gone. Fast forward 15 years, Barry Wallace won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2005. Okay, this is a story repeated. There's also, we used to x-ray pregnant women's abdomens, whether <clears throat> for different things. And uh, there was a, a British, um, Al Stewart, a British um, physician who noted all this childhood cancer and then kind of put two and together. She was an epidemiologist and went, hey, maybe it's not such a good idea to be x-raying pregnant women. And it took 25 years to change the mind of medicine. And by the way, with Barry Wallace, for the next year, they kept doing surgery for stomach ulcers. You know, they did the study and to see if they, they they posted the data everywhere. They wanted to see if anyone changed their practice. Nobody had. So is it any surprise that we're running into this problem with um, <coughs> tick-borne disease today? So here's it, our friend, 14%. So it's funny. One in 10 seems to be, a, one in 10, one in nine, 9% nine of the people in this, in this country have um, Seropositive is brother McDorfe. It's funny, autoimmune disorders are also found about one in 10 people. So again, nature's dirty needles, Borrelia, 300 species. There's a relapsing fever Borrelia, which are separate. Bartonella species, you know, as of 1980, there were only two known species of Bartonella. One from the 1870s uh, was called Aurora fever in Peru, uh, transmitted by sand flies, and 7,000 train workers died from hemolytic anemia, it's a bad one. And, uh, and the other was uh, trench fever from World War I, it was called five-day fever. And until the AIDS crisis in 1980, those were the only two species of Bartonella known. At that time, we discovered uh, Bartonella henselii, which is a cat scratch disease. And, uh, and now, as of January, this is from Ed Breitschwert, of January this year, there's 53 species. They find a new one every other month. 20 are now pathogenic. And, and Bartonella is, this bug is something um, we all need to take note of because it's a, it's a risk factor for, uh, occupational risk factor for veterinarians. 50% of veterinarians are now seropositive of this. A lot of them have gotten really sick. And it's transmitted by more than just ticks. You know, fleas, lice, sand flies, Biting flies, spiders, mites, chiggers, you name it. Almost any bug can transmit Bartonella. In the summer of 2020, they looked at uh, the homeless population for COVID, and they found COVID. They also found a significant amount of uh, Bartonella quintana, which is a trench, uh, trench fever bug in the homeless population. Is it any wonder we have an increase in psychotic homeless people? And all the other species as well. Um, of note, the mycoplasmas, and this, is, this has been education to me, how, how many different health problems you can get from mycoplasma, and they're really hard to treat, and they're hard to diagnose. It's the smallest organism. They have no cell wall. 
They live intracellularly. And the variety of things they infect is just mind-blowing. And um, I thought I knew a little bit about this, but I've had my eyes open. Powassan virus, 2019, Kate Hagen from North Carolina died from Powassan virus. That was the first time we got any traction in Congress for uh, tick money. They passed the Katie Hagan tick bill, $50 million. Sounds good. The budget for the NIH, $54 billion. Um, then the other viruses there, are interesting, of note, the alpha-gal allergy, red meat allergy. Who heard of that in 2009? Well, in 2010 it was noted, now there's over 500,000 people. You could die from this, this is IgE-mediated allergy. It doesn't present classically with wheezing, low blood pressure, and rash. You may have all sorts of weird gastrointestinal GI problems with it. And um, mast cell activation syndrome is another, and you also have tick paralysis. So th these things have a host of problems they can throw at people. And the rule, and if you get, the CDC will tell you, Lyme disease, acute Lyme disease, easy to diagnose, easy to treat. Maybe, but the 20% that don't, aren't easy to diagnose and, and treat, usually have co-infections. One, two, three, four. And the percentage of these are increasing. I'm only gonna, I'm gonna touch on, I'm not gonna touch on Babesia, I don't have time, but it's a fascinating uh, bug. One thing about that, um, as a physician, you need to listen to your patients. So if you have a patient who's going, in, uh, going up in altitude, say you're going to Denver, Santa Fe, and they feel wor worse, uh, these bugs are, are facultative anaerobes. They don't like oxygen. That's why they are, they are not in your bloodstream very long. They get, they, they go quickly to your cartilage, brain, heart. So if you feel worse, there's a possibility the low, and, and long flights. There might be something going on there. There's been many case reports of people going abroad, particularly Africa, and taking malarial prophylaxis and feeling, <clears throat> and feeling better. There's a good chance they have Babesia, because the Babesia bugs are an intracellular parasite, acts just like malaria. So you have to listen to your patients. I encourage everyone to see this epidemic. This came out in uh, May of this year. It's made by two Lyme patients who met in a well, waiting room at a, a Lyme doc's office. It provides a little background on the whole CDC. The main narrator, Meredith Pfeiffer, wrote the book, Lyme, the First Epidemic of Climate Change, I highly recommend. And, um, Pamela Weintraub, who wrote The Cure Unknown, is also featured in this, but it's uh, very well done. There was another documentary, I don't have a um, link to it here, but it's on my website, my son's out website, um, Under Our Skin in 2009. Uh, Kim, uh, Chris uh, Newby was a, the main producer on that one. And the, the quiet epidemic is an immense epidemic. And I'm not saying that every case of autism or Alzheimer's is from this, but the most commonly diagnosed things are chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And that, that number is debatable that I have up there. Some people think those numbers are higher. What I would draw your attention to is the 50 million people who have autoimmune disease. That's 100 different diseases. And this has been on an upward trajectory for the last 30 years. Now people want to attribute it to the high fructose corn syrup, toxins in our diet, stress, smartphones, what have you, but I think there's another reason these are going up like this as well. And all those things I, you see up there have been misdiagnosed. The Lyme disease misdiagnoses those things. Okay. And, uh, and, and close to me, uh, having dealt with the, uh, I've taken care of prisoners my whole life with five prison, <coughs> prisons in Salem in the ER before, but had my, my son intimately involved in this. When he was in jail, there were 100 jail cells. Almost half the people there were waiting to go to the state hospital. This is a, the, our prison systems are now our de facto mental health system, and it's a tragedy. We have relatives in Switzerland that come here, they're aghast of how we take care of our patients, okay? Now look, I see the homeless, I see my son, you know. They're using meth and drinking because they're self-medicating. They can't get their psych meds. And granted, there's criminals out there, a few, and there's a few pedophiles, but most of them just can't get their, just can't get their act together because they can't get from A to B. They have brain fog, they're confused, they're psychotic. You know. And here's a, here's a little graph on uh, timeline on autoimmune disease. 
autism in the 80s, 1 in 10 to 12,000. Now, this, this is, uh, I don't even have 2023, it's 1 in 32. If you're in New Jersey, uh, if you're in New Jersey, some communities, 10% of the kids that are on the, auto, the, um, the uh, autism spectrum. 10%. You get this, kids get this one of two ways, inner uterine from moms, or they develop at a young age during a critical developmental stage, you know, six months to three years. And this is how I kind of look at grass now. One bite will change your life. This is a lifespan. It's a two or three lifespan. The average, um, this is the deer tick. Um, but they, they started out as, t you know, two to 10,000 eggs. That's an average clutch, depends on the species. And by the way, there's 900 species of ticks in the world, 90 in North America. Six are really of note to us. Um, I'm not going to go into all those. We don't have time, but we're going to focus on the deer tick. So anyhow, the summer it lays a larvae. <clears throat> a larvae has six legs. It's not an arachnid yet. There are some of these diseases then that can carry the bug transoverally from the mother via eggs. We're not going to go into that, but usually not. It's the nymphal stage that we need to worry about. These are the, you know, a couple of sesame seeds together size, and they have eight legs, they're arachnids, and they're very, they're hungry. They're feeding. They're hard to see. And, um, and they're going, the main reservoir are small rodents. Okay, deer, remember, deer carry ticks, but deer are just taxis and feeding stations. The serum of, of uh, deer's blood is, a spark of, is, a, is lethal to spirochetes. They, they survive in the white-footed mouse and all little, little rodents. Okay, here's our friend, the black-legged tick. Here's our sizes. The nymphs are one-sixth to one-eighth the size of adult, the females. The females are the real biters. And you can uh, estimate the size based on the, uh, the hard scarabus there to the red. The red part expands. It's Oxosis scapularis, and the Pacificus is Oxosis pacificus. This is just uh, one of the reasons things are going, uh, getting worse. We all know this, living through the heat this summer, but there's just a temperature gradient how, you know, they like heat. They don't like the desert. They need some humidity, but they are found in all 50 states, despite what the CDC says. Um, they're just some places that are more endemic than others. And uh, this is disturbing. I learned this in the past few months. Um, because of the lack of cold winters, our moose population is getting decimated. That's a, that's a moose with 90,000 engorged ticks on it. There's no cold. They can't scrape them off anymore. There's no snow. Okay, so this is the, the veterinarians are well into this because they've taken care of Lyme and in, in, in our companion animals forever, and particularly dogs. So this is kind of the canary in the dog in the coal mine. They see many more, much more Lyme disease across the country than what we're reporting. And I, I don't have all the slides on this, but the state reporting is terrible. Someone just asked me if we have Lyme here. Yeah, we have Lyme here. It's just the reporting isn't isn't good, and it's not. It's just the system more than anything. The people, I'm sure, are trying, but the system isn't set up for that. The CDC hasn't made this a priority. Okay, so veterinarians are detecting much more Lyme disease and tick-borne illness than what we see uh, on the human level. Here's our friend. So they inject the mouthpiece and they create a cement around it. They have antihistamines, anesthetics, and anticoagulant agents. You don't feel a tick bite. If you have a rash and it's, it hurts, unlikely it's from a tick. Okay, unless it has an eschar in the middle, then maybe it had, the tick gave you rickettsia. This is our friend expanded, and they can go up, their body can expand 200 fold. And you can tell how long the tickets have been attached by, uh, there's a ratio they use of uh, the head part to the body, you know, be it 80 or 100 hours. And here's the other tick we need to pay attention. This is our, our friend from Texas, the Lone Star Tick, Amblyoma americana. And uh, it's aggressive. The other ticks quest. They just sit on the end, of his, end of the grass and just wait for you to come by. Now, they don't fly, they don't jump, but actually they have an electrostatic property. If you brush up against them closely, they kind of get sapped to you like uh, a static charge. Um, but this, and they don't sense CO2. This guy senses CO2. He can track down people from 50 feet away. 
And this one causes um, the, lime, the meat, red meat allergy. And it's requesting, and they're sitting over Pacific Coast stick on the left. Boy, sorry. How did we get here? Well, messing with Mother Nature, actually. So we're witnessing and unraveling, both in the temperature and in everything else here. When you disturb ecosystems and you fragment, fracture them, this is what we get. We had this exploding deer population. Remember, they're ta taxis and feeding stations. So in 1930, we had 300,000 deer. Now, 300 million, or 30 million, excuse me. So your friends, when it comes to, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, ticks, are predators. Go hug a fox. Bobcats, coyotes, wolves. Um, a famous, I read this book in uh, freshman English by <clears throat> Never Cried Wolf by Farley Mowat. And it was all about a biologist who went to the Northern Territories to see how wolves were affecting uh, the caribou herd out there. So he was trying to quantitate what, he was, what they're eating. He found that a wolf's diet consists of 90% of rodents, mice. Okay, they're there to weed out the unhealthy animals. It's not their primary food source. You know, a century and a half ago, there's reports in Audubon and whatnot of flocks of passenger, passenger pigeons going overhead that took two and three hours to go by. People, it was like locomotives going over. You know, millions of, you know, we're talking 500 to 600 million birds at once. And these things hoovered up acorns like you can't believe. They were the number one nut-eating bird in North America. It's noteworthy that we're about a year away from the 100th anniversary of the extinction of the passenger pigeon. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, we, when you fracture up um, in a suburbia, you know, which 53% of us live in, you know, we have these little habitats that aren't friendly to, to predators, and so we have all these mice now. So there's 100 different infections, I think I mentioned this, that cause uh, mental health problems. Uh, Ransfield's written extensively about this. So just some quick questions. Can it be sexually transmitted? Jury's out. You can find it in semen and vaginal discharge, but there's no real reported cases of this. Uh, they have, there are some animal studies, but it's not good. Um, can it be transmitted in utero? Yes. Um, there, was a, there was a textbook about, I never heard of this before, but infections in, in uh, pregnant women and neonates, and it was written by a woman in 2001. She had a chapter, actually, in a textbook. It was 122 pages, though, talking about Lyme disease causing all sorts of infections in, in uh, newborns. And, uh, and the next edition of it, it was removed. And no mention in that textbook anymore of that. But yes, you can... <clears throat> Um, these bugs cause problems. Um, you, you can treat women um, with antibiotics, pregnant women, and they'll have good outcomes. And you can deliver, women have healthy kids who are, are infected, but you do, they do better if they get antibiotics. But a much higher incidence of spontaneous abortion if they're infected. Well, what you do if you get a tick bite? Oh wait, uh, does treatment of Lyme disease have antibiotic resistance? No, it doesn't cause antibiotic resistance. This is what the CDC would like you to think. You know, most of the antibiotics in this country, where do you think they go? Cattle. Eighty percent of the antibiotics used in this country go to the feedlots, where the animals are crammed together in unhealthy conditions. We don't seem too too concerned about that, but the CDC wants to go after physicians giving a few extra days of antibiotics to. Uh, someone suffering from Lyme disease. If you have a leg infection and you have cellulitis, you go to the physician and they give you 10 days of antibiotics and you go to the doc and the leg still goes bad or continue it. If you do that for Lyme, you did that 20 years ago for Lyme patients, they'd send the, um, the CDC after you and the, um, the Michigan, whatever state um, board of medicine trying to go up your license. Uh, what should you do if you get a tick bite? Um, take it out. ASAP. The longer it's there, the worse it is. Now, they, the CDC will tell you, though, you're not going to have a problem unless it's in, you know, 36 to 48 hours. And uh, uh, the, data, <laughs> the data on that is sketchy, okay? Very sketchy. It all depends on whether the bug is in the mid gut of the tick or in the, set, the saliva. And who knows? Uh, some of these things, blossom virus, you can transfer in just minutes. Um, but within 12 hours, you can get all these bugs. And uh, so you take it out, and uh, 
Do you do prophylaxis? Um, hmm. You know, if you're in a highly endemic area, you might. Um, but with the caveat, once you take antibiotics, it throws off your serology. Um, but you definitely want to watch it, and uh, I would recommend doing it. Uh, that's what ILAD says, you know, in 20 days at least, the doxycycline, 102 milligrams um, on BID. Now, remember, 100 milligrams of doxycycline is only bacteriostatic, so it just checks the growth. To be bactericidal, you need 200 milligrams a day. Now, there's some problems with doxycycline, you get some sun sensitivity or GI ups, upset. You can also use amoxicillin or cefiroxine. Uh, but they don't have as good a coverage. Now, doxycycline will cover the other co-infections, you know, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Coxiella, Tularemia. It will not cover Bartonella. You can drink a bathtub full of doxycycline and you will not touch Bartonella. So you need to be aware of that. Nor will it touch Babesia. That needs a drug uh, that's similar to the drugs we treat uh, malaria with. Um, a single dose, this is kind of a joke. <laughs> A joke. Um, oh, back to the tick bite. Should you save it? Yeah, you can save it. Do you send it in to have it tested? You should know what it is. So take a photo of it. There's all these websites, tickbite.org, Tick Endeavor on the University of Rhode Island, where I recommend. They do the tickies forceps. You know, this guy patented some forceps that come down with a little hockey stick so you can grab close to the skin. You want to make sure you get their mouth parts out. So none of this fire, no Vaseline no hot sauce on them, just get them out ASAP. And then the other end of that device has uh, a little V-groove for getting it out, particularly in dogs with heavy fur. Uh, it works well for that. And uh, he was interviewed on the Tic Tac uh, podcast recently. And um, Anthony Fauci went to the bar mitzvah, by the way, if you're interested. Um, <laughs> So, um, single dose. That was a joke article in the New England Journal. I mean, their end point was whether you got a rash or not. Uh, well, a lot of people don't get a rash. Um, should they all be treated with prophylactic antibiotics? Um, I would say yes, and that's ILAS position, with the caveat that it messes up your uh, antibiotics. And, and you should also be checked, you know, you know at two weeks for co-infections.